Hey there, I'm Mark Maxey. I'm a producer with Rolling Pictures. I'm the chairman of the Producers Guild of America's Capital Region. I'm a filmmaker and a storyteller, and it's a pleasure to be with you here today. Mark Maxey, welcome to the Make It Podcast. This is going to be, I think, a fan favorite because we have a man, and those in the audience listening, you will get a sense of this very shortly after I read through your bio, but we have a man with us today who has worked uh, sort of across the spectrum in film from the production standpoint and someone who can answer some of the probably your most burning questions as an audience in terms of how to get a movie made and why producers pick certain projects to be married to over others. So I could not be more excited, Mark, to have you on. I am going to read a short bio. Now, this is the Internet, as I always say. So if something is wrong or needs to be amended to, feel free to jump in and amend to this piece here. Mark Maxey is an Emmy award winning producer and executive vice president at Rolling Pictures, a motion picture company delivering development, packaging, financing, production, and editorial services for film and television. Maxey is a member of the Producers Guild of America, Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, and Documentary Producers Alliance. Maxey is a co-founder and chairman emeritus of the Washington West Film Festival, the only film festival to donate 100% of net box office proceeds to help an area of need in the community. Maxie serves on the boards of Women in Film and Video and the Rock and Roll for Children Foundation, benefiting families fighting pediatric cancer at the Children's Inn at the National Institutes of Health. He does have a forthcoming film uh, with Kara Sedgwick. She, uh, I believe, directed this. It has Kevin Bacon in it. It premieres, uh, or it did premiere at Tribeca in New York. Uh, another film with Dustin Hoffman and Candace Bergen um, as well. Uh, you've done, I think, three films this year. And I'm wondering... Uh, how they're doing. I know you've been really busy this year, Mark. How are, is it correct you've done three productions this year so far? Are they all in post? Are any of them out? So um, I, I had done three films last year, one of which has been released, one of which is coming out this fall, and one of which will oh, be it. out this spring. So for the three films last year, um, as they made this was the film that was my and Bialik's directorial debut. That's the film that starred Dustin Hoffman and Candace Bergen. And that came out in April. So that that's available now. Um, it's, it's on multiple streaming platforms. It's on Showtime. It's on all the, uh, you know, the TVOD and, um, you know, most of those kind of video on demand platforms. So yeah, as they made this is available and, and it's doing well. It's got an 87, 81 on Rotten Tomatoes. The last time I checked for audience and critics score. So uh, we're just thrilled that audiences are responding favorably to that story. It's a dramatic film. And again, as I mentioned, it, it's uh, the first feature film directed by Maya Bialik, who is perhaps better known as an actress from Blossom or Big Bang Theory, or now as one of the hosts of Jeopardy. Um, but it's a very powerful and personal story of hers uh, with some brilliant performances by uh, not only Dustin Hopp and, and Candace Bergen, but uh, Simon Helberg and Diana Agron as well. So. So that's out now. Uh, the film that you had mentioned that premiered at Tribeca back in June is the Keir Sedgwick, Kevin Bacon film starring Alexander Ship and Kyle Allen and Carrie Preston and Mandy Brewer. Um, also Simon Halberg. I, I did a couple of things with him last year. So um, that premiered in June and it'll be out this fall. And then uh, the other film that we did last year that I was part of was uh, uh, directed and written by Katie Holmes and starred Katie and Alan Cumming and Derek Luke. Um, it's a film called Rare Objects, and that will be out um, in the spring of next year from IFC. So, Got it. And the Kira Cedric one is called Space Oddity, correct? Correct. Yeah, Space Oddity. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. And then this year, we're, we're on track to do another three films. So we shot a film in, in June that's in post now. Uh, we're prepping for a film that we'll be doing this fall, and then we have another, our third feature we'll be shooting over the winter. So um and then you know, several more projects in development. I mean, it's just always 
always busy as, as you, as you know. So, yeah. Yeah. In the words of Jenica Schwartzman, you are a moving train. That is, <laughs> uh, with, to be said with, without question, um, uh, for sure. And I did notice that rotten tomato score. I, I, the eight, the 87, which is essentially equates to an 8.7, let's say on IMDb, that's really even more impressive because, uh, in our films, the one thing you can't trust, uh, is the user. And I don't mean that in the sense of the audience that watches it. We love the audiences that choose to watch our films. It's amazing. But their sort of judgment on how to score something is is wildly diverse. So if somebody just barely kind of like isn't jiving with the movie, instead of it being a six, it's a two or a one. And if somebody loves the movie, instead of it being an eight, it's a 10. It's suddenly like the next Godfather. And so it, it it's really difficult to like predict or map what a user will score your film. So to have what equates to an 8.7 is, is brilliant. And, and, and I think Maya Bialik, her brand now is just being a super intellectual and her brand is kind of just being the resident genius in the room, um, which maybe we'll talk about what it's like to be in the room with her down the line here. But I want to start in a, in a really fun place and we'll, kind of bounce around as we do on the make it podcast and and go into many different worlds. But I'd love to start with uh, who is Snuffy Walden and why was his story important to you? Yeah, that's, thank you for asking. I mean, Snuffy is, you know, first and foremost, a a dear friend, Um, full disclosure. He's also my partner in rolling pictures, our our production company. Um, He's someone that I had met years ago um, at a film festival that I, I was part of. You know, we became friends, and the, and the more I got to know his story and his his creativity and his genius as a musician and a composer, uh, you know, the more I, I was compelled to to share that with the wider audience. So that's that was kind of the uh, the genesis of the film that became Up to Snuff. It was actually Aaron Sorkin, who Snuffy had worked with on a number of television shows. Snuffy did all the music for The West Wing. Um, and for Studio 60 and for Sports Night, which were three of Aaron Sorkin's four television series. Um, Snuffy had also done music for a lot of other series, The Wonder Years and 30-something, Friday Night Lights, Nashville, and on and on. He's he's had just a really prolific career as a composer. Um, But um, it was was Aaron who gave me the idea to actually make a movie about Snuffy when Aaron was doing a uh, uh, his series called The Newsroom for HBO. And, yep, loved and, it. That. Um, and I, I had taken my wife and we were in the studio for a, a, an episode of that. And Aaron Sorkin sat down next to us and I had not met him before, but he was very friendly. And And when I mentioned that we were friends of uh, Snuffy Walden's, um, he just lit up and started telling me stories about Snuffy. And, and that was kind of the light bulb moment for me that if Aaron Sorkin reacts that way, when you mentioned Snuffy's name, wouldn't it be fun to go talk to other people that have known Snuffy Walden throughout his career and, and get their stories? And yeah. so that was kind of the genesis for what became Up to Snuff, the documentary feature film. Um, and uh, just a fascinating guy, a, a big heart. He's, you know, I mean, the world's a better place because because he's in it. And um, that was really just a, just a, a labor of love for me. Um, and I'm, you know, thrilled that, anyone else likes it. But even if no one else ever saw that movie, that was a story that I wanted to tell. So, yeah, it's, it's a great story for anybody wanting to, uh, or that you sort of exists in the creative field or wants to create film, but it's also really wonderful for those of us. I'm, I'm one of them, Mark, you're one of them, your parents, uh, as well, people who play music, uh, just this idea that here's a guy who had such tremendous success without knowing how to read or write music. I can certainly relate to that because I I took two months of piano lessons and from there learned to play by ear. And uh, just by listening, they used to do, I don't know if they still do this, Mark, maybe I'm old. And, but it, on the radio, they used to always play a top seven or a top 10 and whatever. And I would, re- on my cassette deck, I would record that the, the, uh, the countdown. Cause a lot of times I'd have to be in bed and like, like I had school the next day or whatever. So you'd, you'd record it on the tape deck. You'd have it ready for the morning. 
And then I could replay that the next day, listen to all the popular songs. And uh, in full transparency, Mark, I would learn to play the songs and then I would take them to school. And instead of going to lunch, I would play piano for girls, basically, <laughs> in the in the choir room. Uh, and it, it was cool because I was like I was playing like my own little acoustic melody of the top seven or the best songs around. And because they were mostly pop songs, a lot of them were just three or four chords. But I mean, really pretty chords and really great progressions, but pretty simple. And you could play around with it and really sort of expand upon the, those four chords in a variety of ways. So, yeah, I, I, I relate to Snuffy quite a bit. Uh, you're, you're on the record. Um, I have a quote from you doing a documentary about a person who is still alive, especially someone who is a friend requires a lot of trust. And it's really true. I just was invited to a screening of the Marvin Sapp documentary and I watched it at the African American museum here in Nashville. It's a great place. And, um, or, uh, I think African American music museum, uh, right there on, on Broadway. And watching it right away, you know, the music's going to be great because it's Marvin Sapp, but the movie was executive produced by someone who works for Marvin Sapp. And therefore I thought that there was no risk whatsoever taken in terms of conflicts in his life, how he overcame them. You know, he was never the bad guy, really just, a, it was, all, it was a, a bad guy in a saccharine sort of false way. And I think it really hurt the movie. The movie's going to do well in black churches, but I think it's it, it could have been theatrically good uh, had he had someone independent do the documentary. So I, I preface that, come back to you and say, how in the world were you able to do this documentary in a fair way with Snuffy being so close to you? Yeah, that's a great uh, and very insightful question, actually. Um and and that's why I did take a lot of trust because uh, Snuffy had no say or control over what was in the film, and wow. and I uh, yeah, <laughs> and I wanted this to be a very honest look. And and for the people that haven't seen it, this isn't just a story of of a prolific you know, musician or composer, but it's also a story of redemption. I mean, Snuffy in the seventies was touring with Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, and uh, Shaka Khan, and Eric Burton and the Animals, and, and was living a, a, a lifestyle of, of success and excess that, that was so prevalent in the music industry in the 70s. So as a touring musician, there's a lot of negative behavior that goes along with life on the road in that era. And, uh, and Snuffy embraced and enjoyed all of those, all of those things. Um, and then reached a point in his life where he realized that he was on a pretty self-destructive path and he needed to get sober. And, and in doing so, also realized he couldn't go back out on the road as a touring musician uh, because he'd fall right back into the, the habits that he was trying to break. So he kind of had to reinvent himself. And that's where this guy who didn't know how to read or write music kind of reinvented himself as a composer for television, uh, first with the show 30 something, and then with the show wonder years, which both ended up being huge hits. And that kind of launched his, his career, um, in, in, in television. But, um, because this is a story of redemption and of someone who is dealing with these, uh, substance abuse issues and alcoholism and, and coming through that and reinventing themselves and redeeming themselves. And then, giving back, um, which is kind of the third act of his story is he, he's really dedicated himself to helping elevate people around him, um, uh, which is just such a beautiful thing. He, he's, he's all about how he could be of service to others. So, um, and that's a theme in his story and in the film. So, um, you know, tackling all that, I didn't want this to be sugar coated or whitewashed. I wanted, uh, I wanted to talk to people that knew Snuffy, when he when he was a drunk and when he was uh, abusing you know drugs and when he was a touring musician and then we talked with people like Martin Sheen or Aaron Sorkin that knew him as this proper sweet sober you know brilliant composer and and through all of those stories we kind of reveal who he is we talked to his friends and his family as well as the the work colleagues uh, uh, throughout his career so you know we, we do try to provide a very well rounded. Um, view but but that also did take a lot of trust because snuffy never 
never saw the film until we we had had it cut together. And wow. then he yeah. sat next to me the first time he watched it on a big screen in a theater full of people with his fingers digging into my knee, you know, <laughs> grimacing at, at certain things that, um, you know, maybe were less than flattering, but, um, but very honest. And I think that's ultimately what makes this story so powerful because it is an honest look at, at him, both, both the positive and the negative and, and the genius and, and the demons that, that, that contributed to that genius. So um, it was just a, a really, really fun journey to take. And um, I'm very proud of who he is and, and grateful that he's a part of my life in, in any way. So. And you can see up to snuff on Tubi for sure, but there's other places, Amazon, uh, right? On uh, Amazon, it's on Apple TV, it's on Tubi, yeah. Zubi, it's, it's in a bunch of places. So um, Google up to snuff and, you'll, you'll find it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Everybody should do that. It's a, it's a great doc. And this was a bit of a departure for you. Um, you're normally a producer. I'm wondering how your producing chops or your experience in television in the past prepared you for your directorial debut here. Yeah. So it, it, it's kind of evolved. I started, you know, managing a production company and, you know, telling other people's stories. So I did that for almost 20 years you know, we had warehouses full of gear and edit suites and, you know, grip and electric and camera and all the stuff you need to go, you know, produce uh, television or film or, 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 you know, videos. And, um, and that's what I did. So, um, which was great. And I, I loved the work that I did and I love the people that, that I worked with and, and the, the stories that we told for the clients that, that brought us in. But again, we we're always telling someone else's story. And so um, with, with up to snuff and the films I've done since, it's really been kind of a, a pivot on my part you know, somewhat intentionally to, you know, tell the stories that I want to tell and do the things that are more creative. So um, with up to snuff and with the films that have followed um, those have all been, you know, stories that I found or projects that I've been brought into that I believed in and was excited about. And now when I get up in the morning, you know, the things I'm working on today and tomorrow um, are, are the, the things that, that are rolling pictures from productions that are, that are the, the stories I'm passionate about sharing with the world and not just someone else's story that they've hired us to help them tell to their audience. So it's a very different approach to the work and, um, I'm at a stage in my life where, I'm, you know, my kids are growing, I'm middle-aged, I'm, you know, I've been there, done that, and now I'm really just looking at the next, you know, 10, 10 20 years, uh, thinking how do I want to spend that time, and I really want to do it on things that are meaningful to me, so. Yeah, it's beautifully put, and we definitely are going to touch on some of the different ways you do that, because you do it in a variety of ways, but if you will uh, allow me, I'd love to jump back in time to that time where you were, uh, uh, where you hadn't been there and done that yet. And I want to talk about growing up with Linda and Larry. Uh, <laughs> uh, your parents are remarkable musicians, orchestra level, international, uh, internationally acclaimed musicians, uh, your mother, especially, um, or maybe I shouldn't say especially, but your mother's been, been really awarded and, and, and is revered. How was growing up in a household of sort of orchestra level musicians different in your mind than growing up in maybe the normal or more normal households or typical households you saw your friends grow up in? Sure. Well, um, you know, the fact that both my parents are classical musicians, I think really, really enhanced the environment in which I grew up. Uh, music was always in the house um, and we were always going to concerts. My parents were always practicing. Their friends were often other, other musicians or music faculty at, at the university. Um, uh, my dad, in addition to being a, a clarinetist, um, taught music at the University of Kansas. And before that, I was born in Los Angeles and he was teaching in Long Beach, uh, which is where, where I was originally born. Um, my mom is a concert marimbist and was with Columbia Artist Management and toured all over and played Carnegie Hall and Madison Square Garden and, and <laughs> concerts all over all over the world in between. Yeah. So, um, you know, the fact that they were both musicians and were surrounded by other musicians, um, and also the fact that I grew up in a college town. Um, there's a lot of arts and, and music and culture and education and sports, and it was just a, a great place to be. 
um, which I think made, you know, made, made my childhood more interesting. The, the other thing about where I grew up is that across the street, county corner from the little residential street where, where we lived, was a uh, was a television or a film studio rather uh, Centron Studios made industrial and educational films so they had sound stages and edit suites and this is back in the 60s and 70s when an edit suite was real to real films and people actually splicing and taping you know, <laughs> right films, yeah taped together so Cutting celluloid uh, yeah I mean it was it was absolutely um, film so you know, having grown up there, we'd, we'd play in there. They'd let us come in and help off shelves to craft services. We'd ride our bikes in their parking lot. We'd be, you know, my sister and friends and I would be extras in some of the educational films that they did when they needed and you know, when they had roles for, for kids. So um, I became aware of that, the magic of filmmaking and the magic of storytelling and how those pieces are, are created and assembled and put together, um, how the music and the sound effects are recorded on different tracks and the dialogue and how that's all run through a machine by an editor who splices and times things up and makes things happen, how they did some of the special effects for things. So I was exposed to that at a young age and, um, and I don't know that I had a direct impact on, on my future career, but there was certainly an awareness and appreciation for the creative side of visuals, the visual arts and, and storytelling in particular. So not only was I surrounded by music, but I also had this kind of, you know, this visual element as well, which I think all, you know, shaped perhaps who I ended up becoming and, and, you know, the things that I've done since. So. When a man owns a widget corporation, and he passes away, what you will typically find in his will is that his son or daughter will then own the widget factory. So how did you avoid, maybe, I don't know if it was a potential self-inflicted pressure or real pressure to be a concert musician. How did you, how did you, uh, skip over that and, and go into film and get sort of your parents' approval to do it early on. Yeah, well, so to my parents' credit, with both of them being professional musicians, the last thing that they wanted for either of their children was to be a professional musician. So <laughs> I, I played violin and piano and and, uh, and and then, you know, rebelled and played guitar and keyboards in, in the cover band, you know, which they thought was just noise. Um, so, um, yeah, they they were always supportive of, of, you know, finding your own path. And, um, and I'm, I'm fortunate that I've, I've been able to do that. So I do have to ask you why, Mark, why did your parents want to steer you away from being a professional musician? Yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, because that's, it takes a lot of discipline and, and a lot of time and it's not always easy. I mean, they, they both practiced hours every day. I mean, I hated practicing the piano at 30 minutes a day, which is what they asked of us when we were kids, but, um, or the violin, you know, you had to do 30 minutes a day. They'd spend hours um, practicing and rehearsing and then performing or, and in my mom's case, touring. I mean, she was you know gone six months out of the year on the road uh, performing. Uh, so um, yeah, it's just, it's a very different life and, and um, takes a lot of discipline and a lot of time and there's a lot of work. And, um, and, and I think they, they didn't want, their their decision to pursue that to influence my sister or I um, unnecessarily. You know, they didn't want us to feel pressure like, well, this is what we should do because this is what they chose to this do. This is the family trade sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. which and so they were, you know, very much, you know, I think to the opposite side, very supportive of, you know, find what you're passionate about and um and and follow follow the fun for you, which may be different than than, than what they chose for themselves. So um, I'm very grateful for the environment in which I grew up and, and the the opportunities that I had, and um, and I'm glad that I found uh, you know something that that I'm passionate about. So yeah, music has to be a choice. That's that's been my experience. I had two I had two piano players I grew up with. One guy's name is Andrew Johnson. And the other guy, his name was uh, Rashad, but I'm forgetting his last name now. It's been decades. So both were equally talented. One played jazz piano. That was Andrew. Another one played classical. And Andrew won Grammy runner-up 
which was unheard of because, you know, this isn't a small town in Tennessee and like, what, how did they even find him? But he was brilliant and he was a showman. You know, he, you know, he did the, just his um, mannerisms behind playing the piano were, were fun and entertaining to watch. And he had an ego about it, uh, almost, almost a toxic ego about it where if someone else was playing and he wasn't playing. He was like, why are you letting him play instead of me? And, and uh, whereas Rashad, his mother, uh, under threat of what seemed to be violence, forced him to practice every day. And he was tremendous and he was great, but he was tight. I mean, really tight, really straight up and down and, and uh, no theatrics whatsoever, no joy, no heart in it. Just I'm playing these notes, almost like a player piano. And I've, I've, I've kept that with me. One guy practiced three hours a day because he wanted to, fed his ego, helped him in other areas of social life. And then the other guy was forced to do it. And I'm sure the second he could convince himself to quit, he will. And it just, it's one of those things I, you know, I practiced cause it was doing something for me. Um, and I knew a lot of people who were forced to take lessons and then they, as soon as they could get out of it, they got out of it. So I, I think you're, I think you're dead. The whole trick is if you're a parent out there listening to this, maybe the whole trick is just getting your kids to think they chose it almost like, um, I, I'm, I'm lame, Mark. I took a parenting class when I first had my, my oldest, who is now 22. But the uh, in the class, they taught, you know, how to get kids to agree to things they wouldn't normally agree to. And so one of the tricks is, is to offer up three things you want them to eat and let them choose which one or two they, that they're going to have. So that the power is always in their hand. You do it really young. Hey, so what would you like? Uh, Brussels sprouts, broccoli or, or black beans? Oh, I guess I'll do black beans. Okay. Well, it's your choice, you know, and, and maybe that's how you get kids to <laughs> take on some creative art. They don't necessarily want to take on Mark. Could be also, I, I think it's, it's, you know, recognizing, you know, where your, your gifts are. Everyone has different gifts and, um, you yes. know, I, I, I know enough, really good musicians to realize that I'm not a musician. I can play the piano a little bit. I can play a little guitar. I play a little violin, but I wouldn't say I'm a musician in the same way. I can change my own oil on my car, but I'm not an auto mechanic. You know, yeah, just because yeah, I yeah. can do it doesn't mean I should do it or shouldn't make a career out of doing it. And I, I feel that with, with music, as I've seen so many people who are just truly gifted musicians, I'm realizing that, you know, that, that was not my, my gift. And, um, you know, and, and I'm, I'm happy to have found something that, that I, I am equally passionate about. I would have loved to have been a rock star when I was a kid. Don't get me wrong. If I could have been Eddie Van Halen, that would have been, you know, my career path uh, when I was in high school. But I just, I lacked the, uh, I lacked the gift or the talent. Um, you know, I was not Eddie Van Halen on the guitar and, and here I am. And I'm happy to have found my way. So. In that same vein of knowing what you should do and shouldn't do, not what you can and can't do, do you think some of the things Robert Rodriguez has said over the last decade are helpful or, or hurtful to emerging filmmakers? And to contextualize it, you know, he is known for doing everything. He's the director, he's the producer, he lights it, he gaffs it, he writes it, he's doing the score, he's in post. And I've seen a lot of independent filmmakers that look at that as inspiration and say, I'll do all of it. Even if maybe they shouldn't be doing all of it, maybe their focus should be in one area or the other. What, what, are you, what is your opinion on this? One of the things I love about film is that it's such a collaborative medium. You know, I, I love putting together a team of really talented people to make magic happen, to take words on a page or a blank sheet of paper and turn it into something beautiful or emotional or impactful or, or, or something. Um, so I, I think, um, and while that, that's great for him that he has those talents, he can do all those things himself. You know, for me personally, I think that would make the experience less fulfilling because I I really enjoy the collaboration with other people. I'm on, 
calls with production designers and art directors and directors and, you know, the camera people and the lighting people and, you know, all the creative people that have input on, you know, what it is that we're going to do and how it's going to look. And then on the editorial side, after you filmed it, then been working with the ed editorial team and the editors and the, you know, the graphics folks and, you know, all the other visual artists that come in um, to help make it, you know, to polish it and put it together. Um, I love that part. And that's one of the things I love about being a producer. You know, people often, you know, I think don't quite understand what a producer does. They know what a director does. They know what an actor does. They they know what a makeup person or a lighting person does, uh, but they don't always understand what a producer does. But, you know, the producer, you see, I, I think everyone else involved in the film has, has their lane and the piece of the story that they're part of. So the director and the camera people and the makeup people are all there for the production. And the editor and the composer and the colorist and all those people are there for the post-production. And there's a writing team and a creative team that were there before production started. And, you know, there's other people involved after editing's complete for film festivals or distribution or, or whatever's to follow. Um, the producer is the one person that's there from the beginning to the end. You know, I'll, I'll see a story and acquire the rights to the story or I'll find a screenplay and acquire the rights to the screenplay. And then, you know, I'll work to get a director attached and we'll work to get cast attached. And then we'll, you know, scout locations and choose where we're going to film it. We'll build out our team for all the different department heads that are going to help us, you know, fill in the crew to, to tell the story. We'll go edit it. We'll we'll finish it. We'll take it on the festivals and then we'll sell it to a distributor, hopefully. And um, and it's released, you know, for audiences to enjoy around the world. And um you know, the producer's there from beginning to end, and, and that's one of the things that I love. And each one of those phases is different. Um, the, the logistics you're doing when you're prepping and scheduling and packaging is very different than the logistics or conversations you're having when you're in production, uh, which is very different than the editorial, which is very different than what follows. So, um, And I love all of it, and I want to be there for all of it, and I want to be present. I'm one of those producers that I want to be there when the, when the first camera shot is up, and when we're we're wrapping on the last day of production, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm not someone who likes to just you know go let it happen and watch watch people do it. I like to actually be present and, and be part of it um, because I love that collaboration. So you know, to me, trying to do everything myself sounds horrible. Because <laughs> I, <laughs> I and I think that it's better. I, I I think that the work is better for all the creative input. The conversations that we have in pre-production or during production or in the in, in post-production where I'm debating things with, with an editor or with the director or with a, you know an, another creative part of the team um, and we're trying to work through you know the right answer to a line or a scene or a shot or or a decision um, I think having multiple people weighing in and sharing their different viewpoints enables us to get to a place that's perhaps better than if I just come in and said this is how it's going to be, and we're just going to do it my way, and and that's it. Um, I, I, I'd like to say that uh, if I'm the smartest person in the room, I'm in the wrong room. You know, I, I love surrounding myself with really talented people who are better than me, and I think you know ultimately that collaboration makes the work better. So, yeah, man of my own heart for sure. Uh, I love being on the ground with the people. You know, one thing I had to learn was you can. You, you know, even if you're on set, be engaged. I used to have this idea that it was valuable to be on set, but to let the creatives create. I still have that belief, but it's not so polar. It's not all the way like let the creators create. Uh, what I've found is they need your input. They appreciate your input. You're there for a reason. They they want to work with you for a reason. So bring something valuable that that only you can bring, you know, to that engagement. Um, we, we, uh, are similar in a few other ways too. You know, me and you like to, uh, use our time to hop on boards and make changes in the community. And, uh, we're both philanthropically minded. You, uh, volunteer, uh, on at least four boards, uh, the Washington West international film festival, women in film and video, the artistic fuel foundation and the rock and roll for children foundation, What's your goal with these, uh, with this time and this volunteering? And um, why did you choose these particular uh, you know, philanthropic endeavors or boards to hop on? Why these organizations in particular? Sure. Well, um, 
I mean, I'm, I, I, and I think I got this from, from my, my parents as well, um, as well as the people I'm surrounded by, like Snuffy, but I'm, I'm a big believer in, in service and in service to others and giving back. I, I feel very fortunate to, to have had the opportunities I've had. And, um, and so I'm, I'm all about, you know, trying to make the world a better place in, in whatever small way I can do that. Um, so the organizations that I've chosen to, to be part of or volunteer for um, or join the boards of, you know, all fit into that somehow. So the Rock and Roll for Children Foundation uh, helps helps families who are dealing with pediatric cancer, uh, which, uh, I mean, I'm a parent and, um, you know, I'm, I'm so grateful for, for my two sons. Um, and I can't imagine if one of them as a child were stricken with leukemia or something and we ended up spending months at a time living in a hospital out of state somewhere while they're in mm-hmm. treatment. And so that's such a horrific experience. And so the Children's Inn for whom we, we raise funds uh, provides an environment that's more like a hotel than a hospital for the families that are usually there for an extended stay. And it provides some some normalcy and, and kind of a, a break from the doctors and the nurses and the medical part of the treatment and, and um, provides more of a, a fun, home-like environment for these families and these kids. It's really just uh, such a huge benefit to these families that are dealing with such bigger things. Um, and, um, right. so that's an organization that I'm, I'm you know, thrilled to be part of. And, and, and it's also fun. I, I also believe in following the fun. So, you know, one of the ways we raise funds is we organize a big rock concert and snuffy and, and other <laughs> yeah. musicians that we know will have John Popper from blues traveler and Simon Kirk from bad company and, you know, Ann Wilson and all these people all come in and put on a big celebrity filled, you know, concert to raise money. And it's just a fun thing to, to do. So, um, and then with the film festival, Washington West, it's a film festival. So it ties into the visual arts, which I love. Um, but it, it's, it's, as you said in the introduction, it's the only film festival uh, to give 100% of its box office proceeds to charity. Um, and in a very specific way, this isn't just a present a big oversized check to some generic charity, but this is in a very targeted way, solving an area of need somewhere in the community or for, for someone who's at risk or at need. Um, and then we actually create a short film that plays before every screening of the next year's film festival so audiences can see the impact that they had just by buying their ticket and participating in, in Washington West. It's a beautiful um, idea. Yeah, and, and, and the tagline there is story can change the world. And, and we believe that, that through the visual arts, you know, you can make the world a better place. Um, so, um, you know, that's, that's such a, a wonderful organization to be part of um, and, and, and the work that they do. Um, and then with Artistic Fuel Foundation, same kind of a thing. It's a foundation that was, that was established by uh, one of my dear friends and partners who wanted to give back and, and find a way to help lift up artists. So the artistic fuel, it, it's literally what it says. It's to provide fuel for artists, whether it's a, a painter or a sculptor or a musician or a filmmaker or an author, whatever your art is. Um, they provide programs and education and mentoring and grants to provide assistance and support for whatever those those needs are to help elevate artists. It's just such a, uh, a wonderful thing. I think art is such an important part of what makes you know, the world a, a rich and wonderful place to be. Um, and so uh, for what Artistic Fuel is doing to try to help support the artistic community, um, I think is is worthwhile and, and worthy of support. Um, and then with Women in Film and Video, it's, it's I mean, their whole mission is, is helping uh, perhaps underrepresented voices in the film industry you know, have a voice. And right. so it's, it's women or minorities or, or indigenous people or people of color or whoever it is. Um, women in film is a very inclusive um, organization that's all about trying to help elevate, you know, people, uh, individual arts. And so I'm very proud to be on the board of the DC Women in Film. Um, and it's just a wonderful organization. Um, um, so, yeah, all of these things, I guess what they have in common is they all have something to do with with arts or giving back. You know, even even the, the children's NIH event is, is kind of driven by a music you know, event. So whether it's music or film or or arts, um, all of the organizations on whose boards I serve have something to do with with art in some way. I think uh, Nick should pursue 
what it would take to get on the board of the DC women in film and video. I think he would be a wonderful asset, super passionate. My, my co-founder, Nick, who lives in Gaithersburg, but would, would probably uh, uh, do a lot of things in DC in the film community and, and, and tries to, and does. So yeah, something for me to think about it. I know that you said a uh, story can change the world. That's the credo. Is there a story that comes to mind for you that changed the world in, in your eyes? You know, that's, uh, there's so many, um, and some are, and, and I guess that's what I love about film. You know, they can, they can make you feel a certain way or see things differently than, than you would have thought. Um, you know, I know someone that watched a documentary film around, around uh, the power of, of veganism and decided to become a vegan because they wanted to do, you know, see if they could achieve the same benefits that were represented in that film. I know people that have have seen films, um, whether it's a documentary or a feature film, um, on a particular subject matter, and it could be something from you know issues around disparities for people of color to something about women's rights to something about science or or music or space or whatever, where it's inspired them to make a change or view things in a different way or mm -hmm. or have compassion for for a uh, an area of need in, in the world that perhaps they didn't understand before, um, you know, so, um, you know, across social issues or racial issues or, or uh, you know, women's issues um, or, or any issues. I think there's just um, so many ways that, you know, they say a picture could, you know, a picture speaks louder than a thousand words. And, and I think that's, you know, oftentimes possible where just showing someone, a story or, or a side of, of things or a point of view um, that maybe is different than their, their own experience or perspective um, helps enrich their understanding of the world around them and, and the people and, and the lives uh, that others are leading uh, in a way that they wouldn't have otherwise. So, Yeah, I completely agree. I think film does that better than almost any other storytelling uh, medium. And one thing that we talk about in some of our consults around branding and marketing is this hierarchy of, of sort of engagement and influence. So if you have something written out in text, let's say a, a blog post, that's going to get a certain level of engagement. But if you add audio to that text somehow, then you've gone up an order of magnitude in engagement right away. And statistics, you know, show this, if you add video to it, you go one more level up of, you know, one more order of magnitude up. So this combination of text, audio, uh, and video, well, film does something even better. It goes text, audio, video, music, right? So it's not just, you're hearing someone speak, but then you're feeling how they speak. And that's why I think it's the best storytelling medium on, uh, that we know as, uh, we know of as humans. Plus we're just anthropologically sort of geared to, to tell and hear stories, which is by the way, why I loved your comment on collaboration. Yeah. You can do it all in a vacuum yourself, but you get no stories out of it. One of the things we love is, okay, what was it like being on set with so-and-so tell us the story of that. Well, if you're doing it all yourself, you're not collaborating, you know, you, know, you don't end up with any stories and it's, it's so I don't know. It, it, I'm with you. It's, it's unfulfilling. Uh, you mentioned a few times uh, that you are the executive vice president of rolling pictures. You guys are rolling part in the part the terrible pun. And you've been uh, super busy in the last couple of years. What are you doing differently? What are you doing? That's that, that uh, makes you guys stand apart from other production companies. I don't know that we're doing anything different than, than anyone else other than, you know, for us, we're, we're focused on the stories that we want to tell. So, you know, there are, there are um, some producers or production companies that have a very specific, you know, kind of niche or genre. You know, if you see a Blumhouse film, you know what it's going to be. If you see a Quentin Tarantino film, it has a very specific style to it. You, you know what you're going to get with, with Tarantino. Um, with, with rolling pictures, we don't really have a specific point of view like that. We're, we're looking for really impactful stories and, and really incredible characters. So if you look at the different films we've been part of, they're, they're each kind of very different. We have a drama, we have a romantic comedy, we have a period piece, we have a documentary. Um, you know, each is very different than the other. Um, 
but but they all have very compelling characters. They're all what I consider kind of prestige stories. You know, we're we're looking to to, to make the kind of stories that that my parents and my kids would enjoy, um, uh, which is perhaps different than than the people making Sharknado Six. Not that Sharknado <laughs> Six was a great movie. You know, and and yeah. that people didn't love it, and and I'm sure it made you know the people involved a ton of money, and it was a lot of fun to do. But but that's not the type of film that we're we're going for with Rolling Pictures, and for better or worse. That's not a judgment; it's just just a choice uh, on our part. So, um, you know, we're definitely looking for compelling stories and compelling characters um, that also fit within our lane. I mean, I'm, I'm not making Fast and Furious either. And it's, it's, I'm not looking for car chases and big budgets. You know, I mean, I'm not going to make a $50 million film. Um, you know, the stuff we do skews on, on, on the, you know, under $10 million range. And, and I think there's a nice, a nice space there where we can, you know, we can tell good stories with good people. And if you look at the, the people who have been in the films that Rolling Pictures has been part of, Dustin Hoffman, Kevin Bacon, Kira Sedgwick, you know, yep. Katie Holmes. I mean, these are not, these are, you know, these are A-list people who are part of these productions. So I'm, I'm, I, I think that also says a lot about the stories that are chosen or the films that, that we've, we've been part of. Um, you know, these films are films that are attracts actors of that caliber, directors of that caliber. Um, and that's one of the things we look for as well. So I, I love it. And uh, speaking of Sharknado, the, the guy who writes that stuff, his name is Thunder. Believe it or not, it's his first name. And we've been on a few calls with Thunder. He's a sweet man. And he is 100 percent aware that he is winking at everybody with these movies. The movie that he was pitching us was a pirate zombie musical. <laughs> and the script wasn't bad at all like it but it was you know it was preposterous like purposely and uh yeah thunder thunder levin i think is his name um cool cool yeah. dude and and he is aware that he is messing with you with the stuff that he writes um speaking of scripts how do you guys at rolling pictures assess a script how, what are you looking for when you get a script yeah, boy, and that, um, that's a great question as well. I mean, we, we, get, we get a lot of material to look at. Um, and and like, like most production companies, we actually don't accept unsolicited material. And yet we still end up with a large pile of stuff that, that, that actually is, um, you know, provided for us to read. So I, I have someone who does coverage uh, for rolling pictures who, I mean, that's, that's his whole job is to read scripts and, and do an assessment of whether or not it's, it's worth the time for us. I, mean, I, I don't have time to read 120 pages every time someone says, Oh, here's a script you should read. I mean, I just, yep. I, I don't. Um, yep. And the work that we're doing and, and, uh, and all the production that it's, it's ongoing. It's, it's hard to be thinking that far ahead and we're putting slates together for next year and the year after and the year after kind of in a rolling three year you know, track. So um, we're constantly looking at new stories, um, but I have a team that helps, helps weed that out. So, you know, we'll, we'll have coverage done. That'll help determine whether or not this has merit and is worthy of the time to read or not. And then it either moves up the pile or down the pile and, and eventually we'll get to it and then try to see where, where it fits. Um, you know, I, I mentioned that one of the films that we're developing is a, is a, a, a period piece set in the 1800s. And, you know, if we had three other films that were similarly period pieces, we'd, we'd, we'd make a decision or try to space them out. So we end up, end up with a slate of four films in the same year that are all, very similar. So yeah. uh, I think the films are doing this year, there's kind of a comedic horror thing, which is a little different. We haven't really done a lot of horror that hasn't, there's so many people that that's all they do is horror that I feel like that's not a market that's screaming out for necessarily our attention, but I did find a script that, that I love that I think will be fun. And we have a terrific cast and amazing director that I think can do a good job with it uh, for that type of genre piece uh, that it is. Um, you know, we, we have a, a coming of age story that was written by Sherry O'Terry from Saturday Night Live. That's just oh, a yeah. sweet, funny, charming, you know, uh, from a teen girl perspective, you know, going into, into high school and dealing with all the, the angst and, and it would have been a John Hughes film, you know, in the eighties. I mean, it's that type of a story, which is very different. 
Um, you know, we have a, another film that's that's a, an amazing story that's based on a on a on, on an attorney who uh, took on kind of this kind of um, well, it's kind of a David versus Goliath story. And I don't want to say too much, but I mean it's it's about a real person who did something remarkable and and accomplished something that no one else had, has accomplished. Um, um, and um, those are always gr- great stories. And, you know, for uh, we do something similar. We have two readers and but we set up a template for criteria because we don't charge for the coverage and the coverage never goes uh, outside of our walls, so to speak. So it's really just for us internally to assess. And then there's the way we do it is there's a there's a score. There's a cumulative score that a script has to get before we will read it. Or, or engage with it. So if it just doesn't meet, and it's not perfect, right? Because these are two people that could be wrong. But um, if it doesn't reach that threshold, then like you said, we just don't have time to to entertain it. And, and a lot of times really good is just really good. Like everybody can recognize it. And so I'm curious, our, our cumulative score is a zero to 50 score where each section you can rate one to 10. And I I instruct my readers never to score anything a seven because that's a bailout. I learned that early in when I was writing scripts is that anytime you paid for coverage, quote unquote, Hollywood coverage, you would always get a seven. It was, it's a bailout number. You're not bad. You're not great. Here's a seven. And so we avoid sevens and we force our readers to make the tough decision between, are you leaning that this is really good? Like an eight, or need some work like a six, like make the call. We really need you to make a call. And with in that vein, do you guys have a similar scoring system before it can reach your desk? And and what yeah, we it, do. What I mean, yeah, I mean, we, we, there's a rubric, and um, I mean, I don't want to get into the math, but it's basically a rubric that breaks it down by the different components, and you know, whether it's plot or characters or story or pacing or you know all the other factors that are considered there. Um, that all is scored and then you know there's normally an analysis of the character and analysis of the plot um and you know any questions that or that are left unanswered at the end and um you know that's a great uh, coverage is a great tool for writers as well i mean i, I think if and i yeah. that's a gift i don't have i wish i i could write um I'm, I'm always looking for good compelling stories because i have no creative ideas of my own that's my <laughs> curse that i'm just not bursting with these incredible scenarios and characters and, and scenes, um, unfortunately. So, um, so I love reading, you know, what other people have read. Um, I just want to spend my time focused on things that fit well with the types of stories we're looking for and, and are, are, are production ready and, and doable. That's one of the other things I think, um, and it's easy for me, who's not a writer to, to, to criticize, but I think a lot of writers are so into what they're writing. They don't think about it in terms of what's, What's achievable? And when you have a script that within the, the first 10 pages has introduced, you know, 30 different locations and 300 different extras, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, it's just, it's not production ready. You know, it's just not, not feasible to, uh, at least for a company like, like Rolling Pictures to, you know, to, to shoot that out in a, in a reasonable schedule with a reasonable budget. So um, I think some of the more powerful things that we gravitate towards are things that are maybe a little more production ready where, you know, it's a reasonable number of locations and characters and, and setups where um, it's a compelling story that, that could be told within, you know, the, the budgets and parameters that we, we generally have found we could be successful at. So my baseline script for these coverages is Michael Clayton by Tony Gilroy. Do you have a baseline script where you basically train your readers to say, this is what I think excellent equals. Yeah, you know, I um, I don't know. If there's a single script I point to, but um, that's actually a good idea. Um, you know, the, the, the people that, that do coverage for us um, you know, kind of understand what we like and where we live and what we've been yeah. successful with, um, and so they tend to to view things with, with that through that kind of a, a lens. So I love it. Um, Love to stick on this topic just a little bit. Uh, it's a rapidly changing world. There's software for everything from call sheets to production schedules. In your mind, how has technology sort of changed 
what a producer does, what your work is day to day. And if you had to tell an up and coming producer what skills to acquire in today's world, uh, what, what would, what would you tell them to learn to be an excellent producer? Yeah, gosh, I, I don't know uh, what to say to be an excellent producer. I know that what's helped me um, is, is certainly uh, an understanding of, you know, how to build a budget. I mean, every budget that okay. I do is in movie magic budgeting. Uh, every schedule I do is in movie magic scheduling. Uh, it's an industry standard for a reason. There's a lot of other software options out there that are all uh, great or, or perhaps better, but, you know, for better or worse, um, that product um from entertainment partners seems to be the, the the standard that's used by the industry and and understanding that I think has been very helpful for me. Um, you know, it's important to surround yourself with really good people. So have a good line producer, have a good UPM, have you know all the mm -hmm. all the good pieces and uh that you need on that team. But I I found for me it's helpful even in advance of that, before I get to the point where I'm standing up a payroll and bringing on board a line producer or UPM, you know, if I can go through and break down a script and put together a basic budget, even just as I'm packaging the financing, it helps me validate that the plan I'm putting together um, is, is reasonable. When, when people come to me and say, I, 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 I want to make this movie and I need $10 million. And I say, well, how did, <laughs> how did you come up with $10 million or worse? They'll come and say, you'll say, what's the budget? They'll say, oh, it's five to $10 million. Well, if, if you are off by as much as $5 million, that just tells me you haven't done the work to know what you're talking about. So, you know, when I go to someone and say, hey, I'm looking for money for a film, I can give you a specific number and I can back that up with a detailed budget that says, here's how I arrived at that number. And sure, there's going to be variables. And hey, if you can get George Clooney to be in your movie, maybe your budget will go up because he'll cost more than, than who you had budgeted. But those above the line costs are, are easy to adjust, um, you know, based on, on changes in, in your cast. Um, the cost to make the movie should still be what it costs to make the movie. It's still going to take this number of crew for this many days in these locations with this gear and, and these other factors. And regardless of what happens above the line, the bloodline cost should be fairly consistent from when yeah. you first break it down to whenever you get to a final, you know, locked uh, schedule and budget. So, um, I think understanding that has helped me as a producer. Um, I, I know people that, that are always having to, to hire someone else to do that for them. And I think it, it makes it harder in some cases for them, especially in the early, early stages of development, uh, when you don't have the financing, you don't have the budget, you don't have your payroll set up and it's all coming out of your pocket as a producer. Um, I think that's, that's a huge skill. Um, that's a great point. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's, it's, um, the UPM part is, is, is not to be underrated as well. So that those are, those are all really uh, valuable points. I'm curious what your mindset is or, or, or how you ap approach TV production differently versus film production. Yeah. And, and I should say that for the, the television projects I've done, I, I'm not doing episodic series. Um, I know people that do and, and that's a whole skill set uh, unto itself. Mm -hmm. um, the, the television things I've done have been more, you know, one-off special for, you know, that was on PBS on Christmas Eve with Marvin Hamlish and the National Symphony, or it's a, it's a, a story in the American Heroes that, that aired on, you know, Discovery's military channel for, for Veterans Day or Memorial Day or something. So, you know, my TV work has been very specific, unscripted, you know, one to two hour type of programs that are one-offs, which is very different than a scripted series or even an unscripted series or. Okay. Or gotcha. on TV. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I, I, it's, it's a very different approach. Um, although just because it's unscripted doesn't mean it's unstructured. I mean, you still know the story that you're going to tell. And, um, and you know, I'm very proud of, of the, those types of productions that I've been part of. Um, we, we really told some amazing stories. Um, um, but um, yeah, it's, I wouldn't say that I was a TV guy because I know so many people who are, who that, you know, I mean, a friend of mine produces, you know, Fantasy Island for Fox or, right. you know, is, is doing Black Family Mafia, you know, with Snoop Dogg. And I mean, that's, that's not the kind of TV producer I am. So right. um, it's, uh, my experience is a little different. You know? It's like show running slash producing almost with, with those other two. 
Absolutely. Where, you know, in my world, the executive producer is normally someone who's writing a check to fund a film. And in, in the episodic television world, the executive producer is the showrunner and head writer who's yep. running the writer's room. You know, it's it's the same term, but completely different meaning. Absolutely. And a, a different yep. role in production. <laughs> so. Yeah, you, you nailed it completely. Uh, I wasn't doubting that you would, by the way. Uh in my life in music, a great producer could hear a piece of music. And I, if you didn't know this about me, Mark, I was in music before a film. They could hear a piece of music and say, ooh, they should have done this or that should be stripped away. They can hear little things that the lay person isn't hearing or considering. Are you like that with films and production? Can you watch a film and tell whether a producer was great at their job or not? Can you pull out little things? And, and what are those things? Yeah, you know, I I can, um, I, I know, that, well, there's a great, there's a saying that I love that, um, which I think is true, that um, that art is never completed, it's abandoned. You know, an artist, whether you're a musician or a painter or a filmmaker, there's always something else you would change. You know, if, if you have enough time, you could spend 10 years on that painting or 10 years on that film or 10 years writing that book. And, and at a certain point, you just have to walk away and put your hands up and say, it is what it is, and, and it's done. Um, but um, by the same token, when I watch even the things I've done, like up to snuff that we talked about, there's things in that that I would still change. You know, if I had had more time, if I'd had another year, if I'd had another million dollars, I'd, I'd still be making changes to that story. Um, I, Snuffy feels that way with music. He doesn't watch He's never watched the West Wing. He's never watched any of the shows that he wrote the music for, because when he watched it, if he were to watch it, all he would, would hear is the things that he didn't do or that he could have done better. He, does, he won't appreciate right. it for what it is. And, and um, I, I certainly know painters and authors who are the same way, where it's, you know, you're the tortured author and you get to the point where you've got to deliver your book to your publisher and it is what it is. Yeah. You just have to walk away from it. So, um so for me, watching other people's stuff, um, it's, I guess, a little easier because I don't have that type of a critical eye, so I'm able to enjoy it a little bit more. I think it's harder watching your own work, um, at least it is for me, um, because you always see the things that you would have done differently or you wished you had had one more day on. So, um, But, um, yeah, I don't know that I could watch someone else's film and say, oh, they, they did that well or they didn't. I know what moves me. Um, you know, I know what, what I respond to. Um, and um, so I guess that's really what stays with me more than anything is how it made me feel. And that's true for the music as well. There's a, a line that Steven Spielberg had about John Williams, who composed the music for so many of those iconic Spielberg films, uh, where he said, um, as a director, I, I can bring a tear to someone's eye, but it's John's music that makes it fall. And that's just such a great line about the power of of, of music and how in the visual arts, it, as you had made the point earlier, Chris, I mean, it's, it's what, what the writer wrote and it's what the director envisioned and it's what the production designer created and it's what the actor delivered and it's what the editor cut together and it's what the, the composer put underneath it all. And collectively, all those things can bring an audience into a moment and make them feel a certain emotion. And that's just such a powerful thing to be able to, 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 manipulate an audience in that way. I mean, I, I love being in a theater where you hear people laugh or when you're seeing people cry. And, and it's because that's what was intended by the writer, the director, the composer, you know, all these other elements. I mean, that's just a really powerful thing, which is, yeah, which is what I love about, about the visual arts. Those type of scoring setups, uh, I think is one of the reasons Crash won film of the year when it did, uh, because they were, so good at pulling your emotion on the parts you were supposed to feel something uh, through scoring and, and through um, editing uh, in post in, in, in particular. Million dollar question here, Mark. This is the one everybody's waiting for. And I think you probably get a sense of what everybody wants to know in this audience. What advice do you have for independent filmmakers about getting funding for their projects? How do we... What are some keys around financing? Um, yeah, that's that's always the challenge. I think for any anyone in independent film is um, you know financing and distribution. How do you get your film funded, and how do you get your film seen? Um, and I think um, 
I think there's a lot of ways to go. I mean, that's that's the other great thing about 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 the era and the industry today is that there's more choices now than, than ever. There's more paths forward for filmmakers than ever. Um, I think it was a lot harder you know, 10 years, 20 years ago for an independent filmmaker to really stand out or make noise or or get a film off the ground or, or get it seen. And now with there's so many channels and so many platforms and so many so many uh, methods by which audiences are consuming content and such a demand for new content um, and um, an interest in being part of that. So, um, you know, I know people that have, that have, have raised funds through, through grants or through, you know, co-productions. Um, I know people that have raised funds through, through crowdfunding just with their family and friends to get the money together to go tell the story. And then, there's the more traditional ways of debt financing and tax credits and equity investment and, you know, all those other elements. Um, I tend to, to approach funding as, as thirds. You know, ideally, if I'm going to make, uh, let's for easy math, say a $3 million film, you know, I'd, I'd maybe try to raise a third in equity. Uh, and then I'd try to have a, a third as a tax credit from whatever location where we're filming. Um, and then have a third that could be against pre-sales of the film. So mm -hmm. you, know, you could make a $3 million film, but you don't need to raise $3 million. You only need to raise a million dollars to make that $3 million film. So that's that's kind of where I start. The math doesn't always work up quite as neatly as that, but um, you know, I always try to approach things from, from that perspective. You know, what could I do where, you know, I could I could make this film with with a third of what it would take, you know, uh, in terms of the burden on equity to, to go be raised. And then it's trying to find the people that, that will support you on that. And I've been very fortunate to have you know, found people who have been willing to join me on, on the journeys that I've been on to tell the stories that, that Rolling Pictures has been telling. And, um, and it's hopefully fun and hopefully profitable and rewarding at the end of the day. But, um, um it's, that's definitely a challenge and there is no right answer. I don't think so. <laughs> Um, yeah, I do like your rule of thirds though. There, that's that's pretty good. I think that's a great place to start. And I have talked to a lot of independent filmmakers that refuse to use leverage. And one thing I would tell those to everybody listening, and I've told to those filmmakers is the entire world is leverage. Like, like you you just you just spend. 30 minutes to an hour telling me how much you believed in your film, but you're not willing to take leverage or debt rather to make your film. So I don't believe you now. Yeah. Also, I mean, the, the most expensive money is equity. Um, and um, if you're going to make a $10 million film and you had to go raise $10 million in equity, that's also the riskiest money. So, I mean, that's just, yeah. it doesn't make sense. If you could make a $10 million film with only $3 million, uh, you know, risk and equity. And then you've got another 3 million coming from a tax credit. Well, the tax credit offsets the risk of your equity investors, you know, right, right there. And mm -hmm. I mean, there's ways you could mitigate risk and try to leverage things through the debt financing or, or, or other financing there where, um, you know, to just raise $10 million and roll the dice and hope that the film makes it back to me just seems like an unnecessary risk. So I'm, you know, that's the other thing that I, I always try to be mindful of is, you know, doing things that are within our budget and have a, a reasonable chance of success. I never want to get to a situation where someone who believed in me and believed in my story is unhappy at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, I'm, um, so that, that's always my goal. You know, you never know if a film's going to make tons of money. Um, you always hope that they do, but but you never know. But you know, my goal is really that no one loses money on a film and everyone comes out happy that they were part of it at the end of the day. And anything beyond that is just, you know, icing on the cake. But um, um, yeah, it's, it's a challenge. The other thing I'll say is that it, it oftentimes doesn't take as much money as you might think to do really amazing things. Um, you know, I, I met a filmmaker who had made a short film that ended up in the Cannes Film Festival. It's a 13 minute space uh, epic um, uh, that was just beautifully done and visually stunning. And it looks like it's a million dollar film and he made it with a green screen in his apartment with his friends for less than a hundred dollars. And it got into the Cannes Film Festival. I mean, it's just, he's a, he's a brilliant visual effects and motion graphics guy. Um, so 
he had that going for him. He could do a lot of that himself. But he created these this virtual world in this environment and had a very creative approach to creating this, you know, outer space type of feel where, you know, um, it, it was believable and it was emotional and impactful and yet was ultra low budget. I mean, it was just, I was floored at, at what he was able to accomplish with such little financial resources just through sheer talent and, and, and goodwill with, with friends who helped yeah. him. So, um, you know, and, and there are so many stories like that of people that are really telling very powerful films on relatively small or, or you know, micro budgets. So, um, yeah, that's the other thing. I mean, I think a lot of people think you've got to have $10 million to go make a film and, and you don't. You know, the, a lot of the films I do are, you know, under six. There are films that won Academy Awards in the last several years that were made for $5 million. Yeah. Um, you know, so. Three billboards, um, uh, Nomad Land come come to mind, and we have a saying because uh, I do think you do need to be being talented helps. I'll say that, Mark, and it's like the more talented you are, the more you can get away with. And I don't mean that in a cynical way because I'm not a cynic. What I mean is, is like one guy I point to all the time is Maki Dap. He's a an auteur who really should be making more feature work, but he's made a feature film and a, a ton of shorts and his shorts always win awards. He, he made it to can with, with one of them as well. And he doesn't pay anything for his short films because everybody wants to work with him because he's so damn good and they know it. They basically want to jump on his kite string. That's what it comes down to. And if your kite string isn't floating very high, uh, you feel, you'll, you'll find out you have to pay top dollar for everything. And if people feel like you're an ascending entity and they want to be part of your story, all of a sudden, all these things are free. And, you know, he made a great short film called Everyday Yeti that won a ton of awards. He paid zero dollars for it. Everybody just wanted to do it. Uh, so I think I think being talented helps. Mark, you've been so great with your time. So amazing. This I've learned so much. I know the audience has, too. I want to just quickly turn back to you as an individual um, or turn to you as an individual. I think we, I don't think we've um, zoned in on you yet. Just some things that you're involved in and uh, that, that sort of orbit around you. And so I want to start with just you personally, what two pieces of advice have you received in your career that 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 stay with you like what are those two best pieces of advice you've received that that you think about maybe every day and, and who did they come from yeah so um i one of my first jobs um re relevant to this industry um i was working for a guy who and again, you know, I'm, I'm a bit older, so he, he had he had used the term Rolodex, your address book. But he he made the point that his most valuable asset, at least in business, was his Rolodex. It was the people he knew and the relationships he had built. And um, you know, I, I was young and just starting out on my my journey, and so I, I'm not sure that. And I think now networking is a much bigger thing. I mean, this is before before the internet, before the World Wide Web. There was no LinkedIn, there was no Facebook, there's no Instagram. I think now we're much more aware of the power of networking and social networks uh, and who you know. But you know, back then um, that did not exist, and so that was a, a lesson that that stuck with me, and I always remembered. And so I've always tried to to you know, remember people and connect with people, find points of common with people, and, and build those relationships because you know the the assistant you meet today or the production assistant you're working with tomorrow may be you know five years from now the the executive who's making the decision about whether to acquire your film or fund your film or give you a green light. So just build those relationships and be decent to people and, and you know, deliver on, on your promises. Um, the other advice that someone gave me that I've always tried to impart to my kids is follow the fun. You know, if, if you love what you do, if you're having a good time, you know, it, it's not work. I, I can't wait to get up in the morning and, and get to work because it's not work for me. It's fun. And, you know, I, there's been times in the edit suite where it's been midnight or one or two in the morning where the editor and I look at each other and think, well, we have to go home, but we can't wait till Monday morning. We can come <laughs> back and start it again because we're just having so much fun. And, um, and then, you know, there are other people that have, have jobs or careers where they don't feel that way and they, they can't wait to get home and they're, 
counting down to five o'clock and they can punch out and get out of there. And, you know, so my advice is always follow the fun because if you're having fun, you know, then, then you, you know, you love what you do and it'll always be fun. It's not work. And I, I've tried to live by that. And a lot of the decisions I've made for better or for worse, it doesn't always lead to good, good choices. You know, not, not every decision I've made has been uh, probably the best decision with, with the benefit of some hindsight, but it's always been in the spirit of, you know, following the fun and, and trying to move forward. So. That's brilliant. That is brilliant. I love it. How did you find your mentors? Um. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. I think there's just a matter of 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 good fortune and luck, I guess. You know, I I, <laughs> I moved to Virginia from the Midwest to work for an interactive television company, which is where I had met uh, the mentor I'd mentioned who who gave me the advice on the power of of networking. Um, and um, he just happened to be the vice president that I reported to, and uh, kind of took me under his wing and. Um, you know, we stayed friends long after that company was gone and, and long after he had retired. Um, you know, we'd still get together, you know, once or twice a year just for lunch or coffee. Um, you know, he had a huge impact on on me and, you know, that, that early stage of my career. And, um, you know, I think if I look back at my life, there's been people like that, whether it's, it's a teacher or a scout leader or a friend or a, a, a peer or a, a manager who, have provided something um, that me, even if I didn't realize it at the time, looking back on, I ended up realizing it was a pretty important step or, or pivotal, um, you know, realization or, or piece of information that helped me advance in my career and, um, you know, kind of get where I got. Um, and I guess that's the other thing is always just being open. You know, I mean, if you're passionate about something and you love what you do, you tend to talk to people about it. And whether it's someone you're seated next to on an airplane or, or on a train, my first television special, um, uh, which I think I mentioned was a, a primetime PBS broadcast on Christmas Eve with Marvin Hamlish and the National Symphony performing at the Kennedy Center doing a concert for the troops. And that that came about because I was seated next to a guy in the train back from New York to D.C. And we got to talking and, and we ended up getting along and had similar interests. Didn't know who he was. It turns out it was Marvin Hamlish. And by the time we got to D.C., <laughs> You know, we were talking about what what could we do together. And at the time, I was doing a lot of volunteering for the USO and the troops. And so we we came up uh, with this idea of, you know, pitching PBS and him doing a concert with the National Symphony for the troops on Christmas Eve. And um, you know, that was just talking about what, what we do and, and being open to the people around you and, and present and, and listening and engaging. And, um, you know, I... I, I I don't know. I just think that that's, that's been really helpful as well. It's just being yeah. open to the possibilities. I, I love that. It's, I'm reminded of the movie. Yes, man with Jim Carrey. And uh, even though that movie has some twists and turns and, and shows the perils of saying yes to everything, I'll walk around like that all the time. Like I, I want to know how we can work together and, and in your words, how do we follow the fun together? And I don't want to walk around in life with, a, you know, as an ivory tower guy, like, well, you got to earn your right to talk to me or, or, you know, I, I'm not going to share anything personal with you. I, I, I really am deeply against distrust of your fellow man or neighbor. I'm deeply against it, regardless of what the news says. I have a journalism degree. What people don't realize is that a journalist's job is to show you the extraordinary. And so in ordinary life, people are nice. They're positive. They want to help you. So just, you know, be open. Uh, what are the biggest creative and business mistakes you see newcomers making? Yeah, I, I think um, sometimes it's just in, in what they select to focus on. I, I, I mean, you see a lot of people putting a lot of time into things that really have no future. It's just a bad script or a bad story or, or a bad, bad idea. Um, so I think being able to, to have an objective view of, of things is, is, is one thing. Um, in terms of filmmaking, I, I know that for a lot of emerging filmmakers who were just getting started, um, you know, and I see this a lot with a lot of the student films or first-time films that come in to some of the film festivals I'm involved with, 
you know, people are so focused on the visual, on getting it framed and lit and what's happening in front of the camera and the actors. And, and they're, they're, they're so focused on that that they don't think about sound. And then they've got bad audio. You've got a, a camera mic that sounds like it's far away and you can hardly hear. It's very, uh, you know, unbalanced or unequal audio. And, you know, one of the things that I'll, I'll share with um you know, emerging filmmakers is that, you know, audio is so important. If, if something is out of focus or not perfectly lit or not perfectly framed, it could be a stylistic choice and it's kind of avant-garde. Um, and the audience will be more forgiving of that. But if it's got bad audio, it's just a bad film. You know, no audience wants to suffer through through bad audio. Um, and so um, I, I think paying attention to all aspects of, of, of production um, not just what you see through the lens is, is a, a mistake that a lot of first time filmmakers, um, you know, tend to make that, that they could avoid. So pay attention to audio. It's so important. Um, also production design. I'm not sure I fully appreciated the, the, the role of, of a production designer until I got <laughs> in your films, you know, all the documentary stuff and unscripted stuff I did. That was less of an issue in those productions. And when I got into to features, I, I came to really respect and appreciate just the importance of the production designer and the creative process. And, and it really is a collaboration between them and, and the director and, and the writer and producer and, and other creatives. But uh, production design is huge. Um, Completely agree. Yeah. You know, stuff doesn't happen by accident. Um, and so, um, Yeah. It's, um, I don't know if that answered your question, Chris, but I mean, those are, well, those are creative mistakes for sure. Is there a business mistake that you see newcomers making? Um, I don't know. I, I, I think, I think, I, and maybe it's, I think this industry has a lot of people to talk. Um, and it's just a lot of people that do a lot of talking and, and maybe don't spend as much time or effort on delivering. And yeah. that's one of the things that I found. I've, 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 I've looked back on business conversations of people where I, I would spend, you know, we'd sit through a meeting or multiple meetings or multiple calls. And I think about how many hours did I spend talking with this person about this project or this opportunity only later to realize that, you know, it's just smoke and mirrors and they're not real. And this is, this has no legs and they have no future. It's just someone that likes to talk. Yeah. And uh, so I, I think, you know, the, say what you mean and mean what you say and then follow through on, on what you said, I think is, is good advice regardless of what your career is, but certainly in, in a creative collaborative thing, like, like filmmaking, um, you know, do what you say and deliver uh, on it. Um, and I think that's how you build trust and that's, that's how things get made and that's how, that's how you'll succeed. Um, and man, there's a lot of people that just love to talk and never produce they never deliver. They never follow through and, and nothing ever comes of it. And um, I don't know how they sustain themselves or how they sleep at night, but you know, <laughs> I, I scratch my head and wonder what did I just sit through and, and why? And, you know, I, the, those aren't the people that I tend to surround myself with, you know, the people that knock it out of the park and give it 110% and follow through on what they say and, you know, under promise and over deliver. Those are the people that I tend to gravitate towards. And, and those are the people I try to emulate with, with the way I handle my own, my own business dealing. So um, I definitely you know, try to set, set the bar low and, and over, over deliver. Yeah. 100% agree with that. Uh, I want to give you a fun hypothetical. You have some poor producer who has put themselves in a bind. They've come to you basically hat in hand, Mark, and they have one month before principal photography and they're new to production. They've done nothing. All right. And they need to learn how to be a producer. What are the first three things you teach them to get them ready for principal photography? I mean, if, you know, films are made in prep, I mean, there's a saying for, for a reason. Um, if, if you're a month out from principal photography and you haven't done any prep, then I don't think you're making a film. You know, I mean, that's <laughs> the first thing. Um, it's, it's one thing if you're trying to throw things together for a commercial shoot or, or something where, or, you know, something else. But if you're talking about a feature film, um, maybe I should adjust it for you, Mark one month yeah. before pre-pro. Okay. Yes. Yeah. No, yeah. I, um, yeah. Well, so what advice would I give? I, I don't know. I mean, again, it's, 
Well, it's, well, what would be the first three things you teach them to do? So they've never done this before. They need to learn from you. They've come to the school of Mark Maxey. Oh, what, yeah, what's one, two, three? I tell them to find a better school. First of all, I don't know that I'm the one with all the answers. Definitely build the right team, right? I mean, the, the, mm-hmm. it, it, it is a collaborative medium. And so if you're you know, planning, if you're a month out from, from pre-production and you're putting the pieces together, um, you know, get the right people um, and, and set realistic expectations and have a realistic budget for those things. Um, um, I, I think a lot of people end up upside down on projects because they had unrealistic expectations or maybe they, they didn't, but they didn't set realistic expectations with others. Um, and I think oftentimes they don't have realistic budgets for what it is they're trying to do. Um, you know, they've, um, and, uh, or they don't have the right people. So, I mean, I think those are the three most important factors is, you know, having the right people, having the right budget and setting the right expectations. Cause even if you're off in the budget, if you've got the right people and the properly set expectations, you can, you can overcome that. Yeah. Um, or if you, if you have, uh, the right budget set, has set the right expectations, but have the wrong people, that's a problem you could solve if you had to, you know, you could, you could work around those, but if you don't have the right people, you don't have the right budget and you haven't set the right expectations. I think it's, it's hard to, hard to be successful. Um, so that's I think those are three factors. Beautifully put and reminds me of Neil Gaiman's rule of two thirds could be great at two things and good or average at the third. And people will accept that, but you got to have at least two thirds. Um, What's next for Mark Maxey? Well, I mean, we've uh, we've got a bunch of films that are in development or production, and um, um, I mean, that's what I'm, I'm excited about. You know, next week, I'm doing a, a project with Shaquille O'Neal. I'm excited about that, and um, and then we have a film that we're prepping that's being directed by I, I've been a part of As I Made Us, as we talked about with Dustin Hoffman, and now I'm working with. His son, Jake Hoffman, who's written a script called The Problem with Poets that's just a, a very charming, sweet, kind of coming-of-age romantic comedy set in New York mm-hmm. um, kind of story. And so we are uh, you know, prepping for that. We've got a brilliant cast that's attached and a fantastic crew, and we're scouting locations and then putting that together now to, to do in the spring. So, um, um, And then we've got these other projects in development, some of which I've mentioned earlier, uh, that I look forward to being able to share more about as they come to fruition and, um, you know, kind of firm up. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm always excited about what's next. So, um, you know, for me, that's, that's what makes every day fun and, and challenging is, is, um, you know, whatever the next project is. So, yeah, I cannot wait. I'm really looking forward to everything that you do in the coming 12 to 24 months. Uh, you are um, you're a real pros pro, and uh, I really have to thank Tamara Trexler for a shout out to her for introducing me to you uh, uh, last year. And I've learned so much from you without even having legitimately worked with you outside of this podcast before. So uh, I think the future um, is, is, is so interesting and fun, as you put it. Uh, for not just yourself, but hopefully what we can do together in the future. And uh, when you're ready, you can always come back, do a round two in this podcast, promote some of your films that are out there and, and let this audience know what you're up to. Uh, in the meantime, can you tell everybody where they can find you on the internet, on social media, uh, maybe even see some of your movies or some of your work? Sure. Um, rollingpictures.com is the website for the company. So that's probably the easiest place to start. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, go to rollingpictures.com and you should have some stuff there about the films. Um, I mean, I've got a page at maximedia.com is kind of my personal page, but there's really not much there. So yeah, rolling pictures is, is the place to be. I'm on LinkedIn. Maybe hit me up on LinkedIn. I'm on IMDb. You know, I'm, I'm out there. I'm, I'm accessible. I'm, you know, I'm not Spielberg, so I'm just a working guy who's, you know, every day getting up and doing what I love and, um, you know, trying to have a positive impact on the world as I'm doing it. So um, anyway, I'm always happy to connect with people and Chris, grateful for your time and Nick and, and, and the work that you guys do at Bonsai, I think is, is amazing. And it's been a pleasure you know, being part of your podcast today. So thank you very much. Here, here. And uh, we will end on this. 
have to tell you happy anniversary. You uh, have now been married for 24 years. Is that right? 24 <laughs> years. Yeah. 24 years ago yesterday. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Well, relationships always come up on this podcast as a thing that's touch and go difficult to be in uh, creative and stay together. What's your secret? What can you tell this audience uh, in terms of advice or things to remember about how to stay married and be in the film business? I I, I married up. I think I got the better end of the deal. (laughs) And uh, my wife has just been a huge, uh, you know, source of of joy and inspiration. And um, I I couldn't be doing what I'm doing and wouldn't be, you know, what I'm doing and wouldn't have the the family that I have if it weren't for, for her. So she's, She's fantastic. So, um, and I think a lot of the relationship advice is, uh, is the same as some of the other advice, you know, I mean, do what you say, say what you mean, you know, follow through, um, you know, be open to the possibilities and follow the fun. And if you're doing those things in a relationship as well as in your, your career, um, you know, hopefully you'll find the same happiness that I've been fortunate enough to find. So. All right. I I absolutely uh, think that is the case and it's true. It's, it's really just, comes back to, to what we what we've been saying throughout and it might be the theme of the entire conversation which is people want to jump on a moving train or what you know i guess i said earlier a floating kite and if they think it's real they'll stick they'll stick with you and you'll stick with them and you have your sort of own thing and you're and you're keeping it legit and the reason you keep it legit and the reason you're able to do what you say and say what you mean is because you really love it so of course you you're doing what you, you you don't have an ulterior motive. There's no you're not pretending to love doing movies so that you can be famous. You're doing it because you love to do it. And I think the same thing is is true in relationships. So I wish you and Becky another uh, 24 years and uh, or, or longer. And uh, I think that's incredible. My parents were married for 35 years before my mom died, and so the power of staying together is not talked about a lot today, but it is uh, it is so meaningful. So I was really happy to, to know that I was interviewing you a day after your anniversary. So Mark, this has uh, been an absolute blast. Uh, I know we're gonna stay in touch and uh, have, have a great day. Looking thank forward to round two. Thank you all, appreciate it. Cheers. Anytime, man, be good, peace.